Hello everyone and welcome back to Lawrence Plays where we're taking another delve into Mark's Pyanodons game. Yes, this is Mark Plays Factorio with Pyanodons and Alien Life and all kinds of other weird stuff. So this is um, basically going to be an another episode of me looking at things he's been making and going, what on earth is going on here? Um, so firstly, I would like to have a... Um, a brief apology for what I, for something I said in the last episode, because I went in here, a bit, at the end of the last episode, Mark had got this far and started making these circuit boards. And I said, oh, okay, by the next episode he's bound to have um, Science 1 up and running, that's this one here, which is the uh, Pyand and Science Pack 1. So I went in and I had a look at the recipes. I went and went, okay, it's a basic substrate, that's just cellulose and incubated petri dishes and moss, and he's basically got all of those already. And as you can see, he's now started making this basic substrate down here. So that, that part was okay, and then other, and, but I I also noticed that it needs to be put into a glassware in order to make it into one of these things. Ooh, something just caught fire over here. Um, the smelter just lit up. Uh, yeah, and so I looked at this and thought, okay, molten glass, he's already making that. Rubber stoppers, how hard can that be? But it turns out it requires coal and latex. And it turns out latex is actually rather difficult. So let's have a quick look, see if we can work out how to make that. So you need to go for it through a latex slab which requires sodium alginate, which comes from stone, limestone, seaweed and water. That's not too bad, actually. He's got all of those already. Stone is a thing you can just dig up. Limestone is a thing you can dig up from what's essentially like Panadon's version of a core mine. You just keep digging stuff out of the ground and you get and you get limestone. Seaweed, I've seen him growing, and water is, just comes out of the lakes. Formic acid comes from many, many different things. Um, I suspect it's going to be the... It might be the uh, the Vrock he's getting it from. We shall find out. In, we shall find out in a moment. But anyway, yes, there are there are hopefully ways of making that. And then creamy latex comes from limestone and sap. So yes, it must be the other step. It must be this formic acid that's the difficult part of it. So eventually he'll get the latex together and he'll start making bungs for his. Uh, he'll start making rubber bungs for his glassware and be able to put the glassware into here to start making the uh, the actual science packs. But for now, that's still some way off. And that is why the organic area over here has been expanded a bit. So there's been some expansion up here, which I shall have a look at in a moment. But down here, we have a Vrork area. And as, as you can see, with huge bits of text over the top of here, we've got... Uh, this is all very temporary. I imagine he's going to be using this to just get the Vrork Vrorking. And then he'll move off to some, to some to, uh, to somewhere... To, to move it off to somewhere else where it's a little bit tidier. But let's have a little bit of a look at this. So what, what's, go what's going on here? So we've got this thing here where we are... This is a Vrork paddock. So we've... Um, as with some of the other buildings, I was talking about it with the trees before, you need to fill them up with some Vrork first. And then you can put in the Vrork cocoons. The adult Vrork presumably raise them. Um, and then they, they, eat the, they eat the flora, they eat the moss, presumably. Uh, you put in water in barrels, which is an interesting idea. Um, but we know how to put water into barrels, so that's not too bad. And then you get the barrels and, the, and, and, more, and some Vrork out the other end. So ten cocoons turn into only two Vrork. So this is quite a lossy process. Um, maybe, the, maybe they all tend to squabble a bit as they're growing up. I mean, looking, looking at these things, they do look a bit like... They can look a little bit like the bugs from Starship Troopers, and they were quite vicious. So maybe, maybe, maybe they all end up fighting. We've got the, we've got this uh, native flora coming in here from from the floor, from a plant mine up here, where we've got many, many thousands of them available. So they're being dug up as as a, just as a resource. I mean, you can you can treat these essentially as just being like um, any other any other ore, and they seem to be, as far as the game is concerned, they do just seem to be another ore. It's not like they're plants that carry on growing. So we'll uh, yeah. So they're being dug up. They're passed into here, and they allow the rock to grow. And currently he's just unloading all the Vrork out into this chest over here. Well, he's got a whole five of them. That's not very many. Maybe they're, maybe they're being used somewhere else as well. No, I don't think they are. Um, but those Vrork come from these Vrork cocoons. And those come from these reproductive complexes which have the... Um, well, they have the cheesy music that you can hear. If I take those, those back out again, we, we'll see if it fills up gradually over time. Um, and and <laughs> I've been thinking that uh, Pyanodons wasn't a particularly particularly graphically impressive mod, but actually looking at this, there's quite a lot of funky stuff going on, like these rock paddocks and the reproduction. There's, there's lots lots of design effort has gone in here. So what my, I don't know where I got that idea from, but actually there has been a fair amount of design effort. We now have this sort of um, we have the breeding pod over here with the flora and it uh, with the um, and the uh, yes well less said the better. There appears to be some sort of swimming pool over here that says do not open on the side of it and then some giant insects flying around in here. I don't really know what's going on in here but it does seem to take, you put in you put in a couple of rock and you give them some sap and some moss to eat and they will happily produce cocoons for you <laughs> um, and give you the empty barrels back as well. So yes there is some form of breeding going on in here. There's another one over here. Um, this one seems to be doing exactly the same thing, but it's not feeding out its outputs anywhere. Maybe that was put in to get the whole system jump-started. I'm not sure. But the funny thing about this is 
you need to have some Vrork in order to get the Vrork breeding. And that's a slightly awkward circular problem. So down here we have whatever this building is. This is a creature chamber. And into this one, you can get a Vrork out of it by feeding in, again, the flora, some Petri dishes, which we, which we have. We've seen those before. Uh, a Moss gene sample and generic DNA samples and a Vrork codex. So let's look that up in here because this is all very, 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 extremely varied. So we have a Vrork. Uh, you can make those from a cage Vrork. You can get it out of the cage. Great. Here we go. This is the one way. This is the bootstrapping recipe over here. So feed in the floor of the petri dishes. Moss gene samples come from petri dishes and moss. That's fine. We have petri dishes and we have moss. And as you can see down here, this is all a very, very temporary system. There's lots of chests so just passing things out directly into machines uh, or, or having end results put out into, in, into chests like this. And up here, there's a uh, an iron chest with a load of... Is that glass in there? Yes, it is. Feeding that out into here to make the... This, is, this would be the codex, won't it? Yes, yeah, so you, you put in circuit boards and glass and tinned cable and somehow that gets you a circuit... A, a, a codex that magically allows you to then make the creature, and we saw that last last week or last episode with the uh, with the trees and things up here. But apparently, it works with creatures as well. So yes, you get to bring those in. You've got generic. You've got your generic DNA samples. I was looking at those in here as well. One so generic DNA samples. Those are made from chests, automation samples, and bio samples. Bio samples come from native flora and bio containers, which are pl steel, glass, lead, and titanium. Okay, so they they're a sort of it's a complicated process. But all of this stuff eventually comes back to things that are reasonably attainable. And then with all of that together, you then finally get your Vrork. You do that twice, get your second Vrork, and then you can put them in here and start them breeding. So again, it's, it's a bootstrapping problem. Once you've got them going, you can get them going if you know what I mean. What's this machine in the middle here? A data array. Oh, so this is the machine that creates the uh, DNA samples. Fair enough. Oh, and this is the one that makes the um, makes the bio samples. So, He's only he's been handcrafting the stuff to get these things, the bio sample, the bio containers, because they take all kinds of weirdnesses. Yeah, they take various types of metals and things. So yeah, I can totally see why you'd handcraft these because you need a relatively small number of them. You just chuck them in a box and then they'll get made. So that's that is all. All that coming together has made us these sort of the the the, the these large bug type creatures. And I noticed when I glanced at FNEI, there's various different tiers of them. So you've got Mark II, Three, and Four Vrog, and no doubt we'll find out what those are for later. Although, actually, it is describing them as a peaceful native creature. So, um, yeah, I guess they are. They're, they're friendlier than they look. Fair enough. So, so yes, the uh, the idea is that we're going to be creating... Mark is going to be creating those, and then somehow he's going to be turning them into formic acid. And it seems... It seems that a lot of the recipes for um, for making for making formic acid to come from putting a vrok in a cage and then chopping it up into little bits, which seems a little bit cruel, but you know, you, you, you at least you get the cage back and some meat from it and chitin guts and brains and so on. So these, I don't know what he's going to do with all of these. You can turn it into there's a, there's a hundred and five uses for these. Blimey, um, <clears throat> let's not worry about that too much. But yeah, there are there are uses for these. Maybe he'll stockpile them. Maybe he'll use, who knows. But that produces formic acid from a slaughterhouse. Nice. Um, you've also got, uh, you can get it out of barrels. You can make it out of formamide with sulfuric acid, but that is made from carbon dioxide and methanol and ammonia. I don't know whether that's going to be a better way to make it or not. However, Mark has clearly chosen the Vrok based recipe, so I'm going to assume that that's the best one for his purposes. Uh, this is an advanced version of that. You, if you put in some grease as well, you get twice as much acid. Lovely. And if you use a laser turret to kill it, you get probably get the laser turret back, and you get. I don't know, a little bit, possibly a little bit more brain, and it's kind of hard to tell. But yeah, there are, there are various recipes, only if you shout at them, how is that better? Oh, you get more meat out if you use a speaker to shout, and more chitin out, sorry. And yeah, that's about it. Those are some weird recipes. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I'm comfortable with this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But then I have played through Angel Bobs where you have a similar sort of um, biter breeding program that goes on, and you feed them through, uh, you feed feed them through slaughterhouses, and you get meat and crystals and things out of them from that. So you know it, it's not entirely um, un 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 unknown. And, and so, on. so over here, he has spectacularly expanded the uh, moon drop generation. So we've got lots and lots of moon drop plants being passed along here, and he's fixed the problem that I spotted in the last episode. So we've got the prioritization set up correctly here, and that means now all of these seeds that come down here can be passed into these machines, which will turn the moon drops into to methane. Uh, so that is now going to be piping out a lot more methane somewhere down here, down these pipes. And I'm assuming this, I, I've forgotten what this was needed for, but I do remember there being a shortage of it. 
comes down here onto the bottom pipe, and then pass it. Ah, oh, yes, it was to run the uh, run run the furnace over here, and that's going to hopefully speed up the process for producing the uh, the circuit boards over here. And I say hopefully because this there, actually there's 1,500 of them. That's not bad. That's been running. That seems to be running quite well, and has allowed him to get lots of um, other useful things up and uh, up and being made, like some of the Vrock precursors. That that was an, an important thing that required these. And also, we'll note if we're looking at the inventory. We've now got 50 splitters, so yes, Mark can finally start using splitters and not have to do this sort of inserter dance in order to get past the stuff across. So, well done there. That's actually, I mean, I feel like I'm being extremely sarcastic in that I'm saying well done for getting splitters, but no, I actually quite literally mean it. Um, well done, that has been a long time coming and I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed you managed to get to that level. Uh, there is one being used up here, um, I guess that's for the prioritisation, and just to compact this thing down a bit so you're not putting in anything like as many um, as many inserters to pass this pass the stone around. So the Vrockery has be, has definitely been the main thing that has been done. Uh, if we look around we can see there are various mines scattered around. If I head over this way a bit, we can see that this these mines over here are now running a bit more happily. We've got... Um, at least some lead coming out along, or lead ore coming out along here, because there is now a little bit of a settling being being fed in, and there is plenty of fuel. The fuel was the thing that was missing before over here, um, and but now we've got all, all these up and running nicely. But the acetylene now seems to be a short, a bit, a bit of a shortage. I wonder where that comes from, and I wonder if there's also wonder if there's enough lead. Acetylene appears to come from here, where we are doing. What are we doing? We are turning calcium carbide and water into acetylene and slaked lime, and that machine seems to be seems to be running reasonably constantly. Uh, the slate lime is just being voided, That's, so it is, this is just here to produce the acetylene. Um, up here we are running, well this machine is running as fast as it can, so apparently Mark reckons the amount of lead either is, is, is sufficient or just that he hasn't run out of it, run out of it yet. Uh, if we look down here there doesn't seem to be a great deal of it. I think, here we go, this is where the lead's coming out and yeah there's a, there, there's a decent amount on the belt so he's the, he isn't suffering from a particular shortage of it so there's no need to go off trying it more. Aluminium on the other hand that really does seem to be in short supply. Um, that's just being pour, pour, pouring through over here and all being turned into duralumin. Um, I, I mean apparently that's copper and aluminium but I don't really know what it's for. Um, the only thing I can think of that it's for is, 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 for, is from Mistborn, where you use it to make your powers far more powerful by using up your entire metal store in one go. But I'm fairly sure that's not going to be what it's being used for up here. Um, it is actually being passed out down here, and it's just filling up a chest. I think the fact that there's no insufficient aluminium coming along here, probably not a major problem, because um, at the moment we're not using the Duralumin for anything. Is there anything else new over here? So, there, as I said, he's been getting on with the... Um, with the system here for from starting to make the uh, the science pack wands with the making the uh, what's it called research substrate basic substrate so that's going quite nicely we've got the um, the, the infused petri dishes coming down here how does this what is even is this it's a microorganism mine so you bring in a petri dish and it sort of you grow some culture in it uh, that's nice I it, it, sure <laughs> but with that means we've got it we've got a supply of petri dishes coming in here and a supply of agar jelly cubes coming in here so I did notice earlier when I was looking around that the jelly cubes they're not in short supply. He's got he's got sufficient of them, but they are coming through fairly slowly from up here or somewhere. What, what? So how do? We, oh, these are made out of seaweed. Up, oh yeah, here we go. So yes, they're made out of seaweed and steam, and that gives you a nice little block of agar that you can then go and grow grow bacteria in or something. So uh, yeah, this is this is a seaweed crop area, grow, seaweed growing area, and that's being used for quite a few different things. That's, and and, and um, actually no, it isn't. It is literally just being used for the agar. It's the moss that's being used for lots of different things. We are, we're sending it off to grow trees, we're sending it down here to grow rock, we're sending it all over the place. The moss seems to be a sort of a very, very common precursor, and that's quite convenient because it just takes seeds and... Oh wait, that's saplings. Down here. It just takes muddy sludge and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide presumably comes from just burning coal or something like that. Yes, up here we are. Uh, okay, we're burning coke and limestone to make lime and carbon dioxide. The lime seems to be a bit of an overload here, although we are turning it into slaked calcium carbide and then turning that into into the um, into the into the into the acetylene that we're sending off for the lead mining. So these are all sort of working together, and that's on the one hand that's nice because it means you're using up all of the byproducts. On the other hand, it's less nice because it means that if one thing is running a bit slowly, then it causes other things to jam up, like up here where we've got we've got all the um, all the limestone we could possibly want because this, as I said, is a soil extractor. It just digs it up out of the ground. It's basically a core miner from space exploration, but it only produces one thing, and then that gets passed down here, and we use it up as quickly as we can, and then we, we, uh, we, we then we're just full of lime. The carbon dioxide goes off to make more moss, and 
Well, actually, there's a fair amount of that, so we do seem to be okay with carbon dioxide. This whole system does seem to be working at about the right speed. And then in here, we need some stones. So that's where there's a big supply of stone coming up here. And the muddy sludge. Oh, all right, all right, I'll buy it. Where do we get muddy sludge from? That comes from over here somewhere. Yes, here we go. Here's a sludger. A washer, in fact, where you take in soil and you, you, you add water to it to make mud. I mean, I, fair enough. Can't complain about that. And here is a thing that this is this is a soil extractor. It's just digging up soil out of the ground. Then we're mixing it with water to make mud, passing it off in a pipe and growing moss in it. Right, sure, sure, why not? And then the moss seems to be growing quite nicely. We're feeding it all out onto the onto the belt over here, and there is there is more than we need. So what else has happened? I notice there's a lot of stone. So Mark likes to carpet areas with stone bricks or concrete or whatever. So that's been going on over here, and um, a lot of a lot of a lot of his base is now sort of is now suitably uh, suitably tarmac suitably floored. So um, that's without a W, two O's and an R. So he can run around in it and, and move a little bit more quickly. Other than that, I'm not seeing anything else that's new. I suspect basically all of his um, efforts since the last video have pretty much gone into bug fixing and then trying to pound it and then essentially pounding his head against the whole latex and rock problem. Uh, this is now is is working as you can see. He's got some, he's got his rock being grown here. Maybe this bit will be left as a as a sort of a permanent installation, which because it's producing the rock at a suitable rate. Uh, I could probably get rid of this one though because I think two of those is excessive. Um, and just clear up the stuff around the bottom. There's probably a little bit of further tidying up that could be done around the sort of all these things around here that are just needed for the bootstrapping. But then on the other hand, there might be a temptation to leave some of these things in for bootstrapping whatever the next brokery or the next um, animal thing is. Um, also, the potential, to, if, if, you, if he does remove all of these, these machines down here, then we could easily put in another one of these down here. Because all that, all that requires is a, is a feed of water barrels and a feed of these uh, cocoons. Um, and then it outputs the barrels and the uh, and, and the rock on the other side. And this seems to be quite slow. It's taking, as you can see, this is taking a very, very long time. It's 160 seconds to craft. And at the moment, this machine is working at a speed of 0.5, even though it's got all these rock in here acting as speed modules. <clears throat> so it's a slow system. All the organic stuff is all, all the um, organic stuff is slow because it takes a long time to grow animals or grow plants or grow whatever. So yeah, having a, having a row of these going down here would be quite good, especially as these guys seem to be able to churn the cocoons out at quite a rate. Um, I think there's going to be they're, they're, one of these is going to be a, more than capable of keeping at least four of these running, I suspect. Ah uh, yes, and here's here, oh no, this is, this is this is ah this this is new. So over here we've got a we've got a crusher that's turning gravel in. Oh, right, so we're bringing in stone, crushing stone down into gravel, and it's crushing gravel down into sand. Then turning the sand and whatever comes from here, which is lime again, uh, turning that into concrete by the looks of it. So this feels this feels quite strange actually, because it feels like um, Mark has managed to get he's only just got basic splitters and yet he's already building concrete. Okay, this mod pack works very very differently to, to vanilla or to space exploration, which is much more vanilla aligned in the early early parts especially. But still, having concrete this early feels feels kind of strange. But um, sure, why not? Um, Oh, and also, I know this is also going to be producing carbon dioxide, and perhaps a bit more of it than the other the other area was, and that can then feed this up here, back in, into the main sort of carbon dioxide bus that's running up and down the base over here, and feeding his moon drops and his uh, and his moss growing. Oh, what's this? Ah, oh, this is also making. Ah, here, this is the main carbon. This is the main where all the carbon dioxide is coming from. He's just simply burning coke to produce carbon dioxide. I knew. I thought there had to be something like this around somewhere because. I mean, in, in, in the real world, producing carbon dioxide is so easy, you just burn stuff. So these other ones are just using it as an overflow to get rid of it, it, it get rid of any spare. Uh, that's going to be tricky to balance without pumps, but uh, hopefully I'll get pumps at some point in it. Oh, he's got an underflow valve, nice. Okay, so an underflow, underflow valves are great, but the more advanced mod packs often come with various different types of valves, and these are really, really useful if you can spell them. So you've got what we've got here. We've got a check valve. So okay, so that's that's basically a diode. It's a one-way valve. Only allows stuff to flow through in one direction. Fine. That's useful, but not not quite as vital. And you've got an overflow valve, which only flows when input is over eighty percent. So this is great if you want to use something as um, if you want to get rid of excess. So for example, you you have somewhere that's producing carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and you want to make sure you always get rid of it. But you have other places that you, that you want to get rid of as a sort of you want to use normally if you can. That's not a great example, really, but you can use this if you want. If you want to only use something, only use an, only use a source when its output 
kind of overflows a bit. And then you've got underflow valves. These are much more useful. And so this, these will t keep this pipe topped up to 80%. So as long as this is a full, full over 80%, then if this ever gets below 80%, it'll allow the carbon dioxide to flow through. And that's why this is basically pegged at 80% because these are keeping it topped up. But that means there's always room in the, uh, in, in the pipes for any of the carbon dioxide that's coming out of this process or this process. So I take back everything I was saying earlier about the, uh, the carbon dioxide looking extremely awkwardly balanced. In fact, it's absolutely fine um, because we've got this thing here that will, that will provide as much as is required as a lower priority compared to the other produ production areas. So yeah, that, that, that's, all, that's all great. Oh, yes, of course, this is what overflow valves are for. So over here, this is this is the um, over here in this area of the base. This is the tar processing. So in here, we are bringing in. Um, in this case, we're bringing in tar, turning it into middle oil, creosote, anthracene oil, and pitch, and all those things are being passed out in various ways down the down the pipes. But here we can see that we uh, we we have more anthracene oil than we know what to do with. So in this case, we're using the overflow valve to dump. When this goes over eighty percent, it'll dump the excess out into here. And that means we always have something to do with the, uh, the tar that's being produced, and we always have, and when these machines will always be able to run, and we won't even even if say the middle oil or the anthracene backs up, we'll still be able to pull, or we'll still be able to use the the creosote, for example, or whatever, um, and everything should always be absolutely fine. Uh, this is all apparently temporary and going to be redesigned at some point, but the idea the idea stands. It was also pointed out to me in the comment section of the, the, the video uh, that these machines over here that are smelting the glass and possibly some other machines as well uh, will take in will take in lots and lots of different types of fuel. That's why it doesn't say what the fuel is down here. It just has to be something that they can burn, whether that's hydrogen or methane or probably other things as well. Hopefully, there's a way somewhere of telling what what resources you can put into here. But as it is, um, you see there, there this 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 one is using is using hydrogen when there's any available. This one over here is using methane uh, and there's lots and lots of that available. So there are various different options, different ways of doing it. And over here, we can see we're bringing in the uh, those those quartz crystals again, smashing them down into crushed quartz and some stone as well. The stone can be taken away by belt, and then and then turning the, uh, the quartz crushed quartz into molten glass and the molten glass into glass plates, and those can be fed away for wherever they're needed. So, I'm going to make the same prediction I did uh, last time. I'm going to say that I think in the next episode, Mark is probably going to have got Science Pack 1 up and running because he's now um, he's nearly there now, I think. Let's have another look at the let's have another look at it. So there's the glassware which requires the rubber stoppers, which requires the latex, which requires the latex slab, which requires the uh, this, okay, so here we go. This is where it starts to get a little bit complicated because there's three things going in here rather than just being feed one machine into the next machine into the next machine and eventually you'll get out the stuff you want. So the, uh, this one is, is stone, limestone, seaweed and water. That's, as I said, pretty easy. Um, it just the, the hardest part is going to be making sure you have all of those in the same area. Because at the moment, the seaweed is only being made here and passed up into this, this agar machine. But there's no reason we couldn't have another belt coming off the bottom of here and probably finding its way all the way over to here somewhere. I don't know, I don't know exactly where he's going to do it, but I don't see that as being too much of a challenge. The creamy latex is limestone and sap. And we've got we've got limestone. We've seen limestone already today. We've, yeah, here it is. Here's limestone. Limestone is just being literally dug straight up out of the ground. That's trivial. Sap comes from the tree plantation systems down here. So we've got these sap trees, um, and the sap extractors are producing plenty of sap. And that is in fact already on the bus. So that one's easy. That one's done. And so combining those two in a washer, which and we've already seen him making wash. He's made some washers. That's going to be absolutely fine. It's this one, the formic acid, that's the challenging one. And as we've seen, uh, if, you, if you take a cage, so he's going to need to make cages, but a cage is is probably, is iron, oh, titanium and sold. They're all, I think they're all solved problems. Do we have titanium? I think he's, I think he's got titanium. I take it back. I don't see any titanium. So, okay, he's going to have to make titanium. That might be the hard part. But that comes from titanium ore. You just smelt it. Um, and the titanium ore, that's another one that requires a settling to mine it, or weird things he hasn't discovered yet. So yes, um, basically you need to find you need to find some titanium ore, mine it with a settling, and then you can get and, and, and yeah. So that's going to be the, that's going to be the next thing, and that's going I think is going to be the, the main challenge remaining. But once you've got that, you can then turn iron and titanium and solder, which is already made over here for the uh, for the circuits, uh, in order to make the cages. You can combine that with a vrok, and then you get a caged vrok. And as you, as we've seen, he's got a few vrok. 
Uh, then you chop them up into little pieces, you get the cage back, so at least you can reuse those, you don't need a huge amount of titanium, and that gets you a spray of formic acid. That can be then turned into, and then that, as we've seen, can then go into be made into the latex. So, for each rock you slaughter, you're going to get two latex slabs, which means two latex, or latices if you will, uh, which means eight rubber stoppers, which means um, you need four for you, which means he's going to make two times two, he's going to make four glassware, which means he's going to be able to make four four science packs. So that's going to get through quite a lot of rock, to be quite honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's not far off a of one to one rock. It's slightly slightly better than one to one, but mostly he's going to be making about just over one science pack per rock he manages to slaughter. So that is going to be. Um, a rather slow process, and so yeah, this this rockery is going to need to be, is going to need some serious expansion. But that's all to come. So I don't see any of that being insurmountable. I know uh, Mark is quite good at Factorio, so I suspect that he's going to be able to um, find some titanium. Is, is, is there a titanium patch around? Antimony, borax, iron ore, niobium. Titanium ore, here we go, 7 million of it over here. So that's going to be another one of these mines, feed the acetylene out there, probably boost acetylene production to be honest, because at the moment it seems it's barely keeping up with lead requirements. Build a mine over here, feed it all the way back over, and then realise, oh dear, the smeltery isn't big enough, and probably have to build a second smeltery underneath over here, I guess. Um, and then, yes, eventually that'll, that'll, allow, that'll allow the rock to be... Um, uh, mistreated, and we can have a supply of, um, a supply of science one packs being made. Wow, that's quite a big, um, quite a big thing that needs to need to still be done. But it doesn't seem it doesn't seem insurmountable. I have every faith in Mark that he's going to be able to do that. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope it's been uh, interesting and and in giving you some um, insight into the weirdnesses and the uh, and, and and the slightly seventies parts of um, of, of Pine Islands and the, the interesting graphics as well. Uh, so I shall be back tomorrow uh, with, with some streaming. I shall be, um, depending on whether you're a supporter or not, we'll either be starting the XCOM 2 stream tomorrow or continuing it tomorrow. Uh, so please come along to that. If you haven't already submitted to Soldier, uh, please do so. There's instructions on how to do that in a video on the channel. Uh, Mondays I shall be, we shall be playing uh, Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 as usual. Uh, that's going well, I think, but it's been a little bit, little while because I've been on holiday. So we'll, uh, we'll find out how that's been going. Uh, there are also the catch-up videos at the weekend on Fridays and Saturdays for uh, space exploration, so make sure you check those out. And every Tuesday there'll be a miscellaneous, factor probably Factorio or possibly miscellaneous other video coming out on the channel as well. So, thank you very much for watching. Please make sure you're subscribed to the uh, channel, and um, if, you, if, if you're not already, and uh, because, because there's lots and lots going on, lots of interesting stuff, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching, and goodbye. And I suppose this is where you get your first seaweed from as well. I'm still amused you have the technology to build these stompy robots in your fa in your forestries but can't even build a um, a splitter earlier on. <laughs>